God. How many people are here for an encounter? For an encounter. Before I take us to the next session, um, let me say something that has helped me over time prepare for encounters and meetings like this. God told me something once. You know, he says that I am the omnipresent God. And I thought I understood it. And I said, oh yes, I understand it. Because it means that you are at this, you are everywhere at the same time. And he told me that's only a part of it. I am in every time at the same place. I'm not just in everywhere at the same time. I'm in every time in the same place. So even though he's in so many places right now, he's here. Yesterday he was here. Today, tomorrow. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. And so because he's in every time in the same place, then you can be sure that whilst you are here, he knows your tomorrow. He knows your day after tomorrow. He knows your next year. He knows your 20 years from now. And so the things that he will be depositing today will be, do you understand? So be here understanding that the things that you will receive here today are for yesterday, today, tomorrow. They are timeless. Yes? Praise God. I was told to introduce myself and read my bio, but I don't see how that's going to happen. <laughs> my name is Akin Labi Akin Bulumo. I am a visual storyteller and a brand interpreter. And besides telling stories, the only thing that I love more than telling stories is listening to people's stories. Because I love to listen to stories, to hear what it is that they have to say to learn lessons from what it is that people have gone through and the experiences that they've had in life, in career, and more importantly, with their relationship with God. And so today, I have the opportunity to speak with two people. Um, one isn't here yet, but the other person is, is on the way. One is here. Two people that I will use, that the only word that I can use to define who they are is genius. And I will explain why. Somebody said to me a couple of years ago that genius means standing in front of God's people but at the same time getting out of God's way. And it, it blew my mind. And, and so this is why I call these people geniuses because they have been conduits. They have been people who have stood in front of God's people but at the same time gotten out of God's way and allowed God to use them, right? Um, so without wasting more time, I would like to invite my first um, guest um, by the name of Mr. Kola Ludbodi. Put your hands together, please. Thank you. Thank you. Kola Ludbodi was born in the city of Lagos. He had his primary education in Atondaolu School for the Handicaps between 1971 and 1976. For his secondary school education, he started from Baptist Academy, Obani Koro, Lagos, in 1977, but concluded at Ede Baptist High School, Ede, Oshun State, in 1983. Kola gained admission into the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, in 1984, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Demography and Social Statistics in 1988. He observed his National Youth Service Corps with the National Population Commission NPC, and he was retained by the commission as a population statistician. Immediately he concluded his service in 1989. Kola left NPC for the North South Bank NSB in 1992. He became an entrepreneur immediately he left NSB in 1995. He was the CEO of Josh Cyrus a human resource and outsourcing organization, after which he became the inaugural CEO of Background Check International, BCI, pioneers of the background check industry in Nigeria and West Africa in 2004. Kola Olubodi is Africa's leading background check expert. 
He is also the inaugural chairman of the Society for Professional Background Screeners, Nigeria, and the author of the intriguing and life-changing book, Through It All, Memoir of My Many Trials and Triumphs. The book captures some of the challenges he was faced with from childhood till adulthood and how he surmounted them. Kola Olubodi is the 2021 Marketing Edge Outstanding Background Check Brand Personality of the Decade. Kola is also a member Association of Christian Investigators, ACI. Kola was a speaker at the 2018 edition of the Excellence in Leadership Conference, an annual program of the Daystar Christian Center. He is a fellow of the Institute of Information Management in Africa, FIIM. He is also the first African member of the Professional Background Screeners Association, PSBA, USA. He is also an advisory board member of the International Due Diligence Association, IDDA, USA. He is also an alumnus of the U.S. Department of State International Visitor Leadership Program, IVLP. He is a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, ACFE, USA. He is also a member ASIS International, USA. He is also a member of the Nigerian Institute for Industrial Security. Kola is a winner of several awards, some of which are CNBC's West Africa Entrepreneur of the Year Award finalist, PSR National Development Merit Award in the sphere of background checks, screening and verification services, Rotary International Achievers Merit Award, Kola is widely traveled. He's a public speaker and he facilitates in workshops and conferences. He is an encourager whose hallmark in life is to always impact other people's lives for good and for God. He is married and blessed with two precious children. Ladies and gentlemen, with the loudest ovation, please make welcome Mr. Kola Olubodi. I remember the first time I heard your introduction and that profile, I was super inspired. And it's interesting because the last part of it says that um, you are an encourager of people and you like to impact. And just by listening to your journey, right, without even saying anything, I feel already <laughs> encouraged, impacted, and inspired, right? Um, and I'm, I'm excited here because as much as I am moderating this, I feel like I am going to be learning as well, right? So I'll be asking questions to learn, but then hoping that everybody here will also learn from the questions that I, that I ask. Um, so I want, I want to start with um, the question, right? If there was, if, if you were to, to use a few words to describe your journey so, so far, how would you define or describe your journey so far? All right. Thank you so much, Aki. And um, before I answer, I want to thank um, my sister. Um, I call her sister Jumi. <laughs> uh, we were together in Ife way back. Uh, great. And. Um, I thank God that the way she was then, outspoken for the Lord, aggressive for the master, that's the way she is now. <laughs> and um, each time I, I follow her, I'm not running background checks on her, but I'm following her. <laughs> and I'm always glad for all the things I see God doing in her life. All right, so I'm so glad to be in um, Awesome 2022, and um, I don't take this invitation for granted. All right, so if I want to summarize what the Lord has done in my life, uh, I will say I've experienced the goodness of the Lord. I've experienced the faithfulness of God. God has been kind to me. 
in all circumstances, he has been kind to me. So that's the summary. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful summary. Um, so just following that, um, what are some of the things, you know, so, so I, I, I saw like a small sim snippet from your book, Through It All, um, which is an amazing book, by the way. But before we go into the book, the name Through It All says that you have had a life where there have been multiple challenges and you know, regardless of them, you know, you have come out. I want you to just first, before we go deep, to sort of just give highlights of your journey without skipping or without um, um, downplaying the challenges that you have faced. All right, thank you so much. True it all. Um, my life from day one, uh, <laughs> almost up till today, it's always been full of challenges. The day I was giving birth to, um, of course, my mother told me what happened that day. I was weighing 4.5. And then when I came out of the womb, they discovered that my umbilical cord was knotted in three places. And um, my mother said they started, she saw the medical people running elder skeleton. And um, of course, she said they just felt there was something wrong somewhere. And uh, when she told me that, I had to go online to find out what happens when umbilical cords are knotted. Of course, that's the source where food and oxygen and everything goes into the baby, you know. And I came out of the womb um, with the knot. So the fear was that they never knew how long it has been like that. So maybe oxygen had not been passing straight to my brain. So the fear of um, cerebral palsy was there, you know? And after many tests, they discovered that, okay, I was okay, and they were able to um, unknot the knot, you know? Um, of course, that was like the first major challenge in my life. The second challenge happened when I was two years old. Um, of course, one day, I just told my mom, I just want to ease myself, and. She gave me the party and um, she left me and went out. And by the time she came back, she discovered I was flat on my, on my chest. And um, she said I was very troublesome then. So she thought I was playing one of those pranks. And she said, call her, get up. And I said, mommy, I can't get up again. And she said, what do you mean you can't get up? Get up. And um, she said she pulled me up. And as she pulled me up, I went all the way to the floor again, the two legs were paralyzed, you know, and um, of course, that was like a big problem in my life, and they were taking me all over the place. Of course, at first, most times when I don't have time, I say um, what they said, that it was polio, but then when they started taking me to, for treatment, the things happening were not looking like polio, the first man and herbalist that said, ah, Ibononi, you know, it's high fever. We just need to give him some herbs and then it will be okay. I know, um, um, so my mother takes, him, takes me to him every day. And that was one of those days that she took me to him and um, the wife of the man said, no, Emma Jacob Wale, you are not entering this place. Your son can't enter. Your, your son is not who you think he is, you know. And my mother said, let, let me at least, let me see the herbal man. And she entered and she asked, the, she saw the man, he was covered with um, whether misus or chicken pox from head to, 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 to toe. And my mother said, no, you were not like this yesterday evening. What happened? And the man said, um, she, he told my mother in Yoruba, she said, Amwaye came over the night and said, why are you treating that boy? Of course, on Waiye means which is, you know. And um, so he said, because they, 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 he attempted to treat me, uh, they decided to discipline him. They flogged him. And so what you saw outside was the impact of the flog. And so that was the end of the treatment. Of course, I was taken from that place. My grandma used to be staying at Belkota. She said, bring him over there. Um, since it's his IA problem, we handle him. 
and they took me to an affair. And um, when I got to the affair, the affair was doing his unto and everything. And then, of course, uh, one day they just discovered that the affair just uh, dropped down and he died. And um, <laughs> that was the end of the treatment with the affair. And they said, no, this one is of Atala that can handle it. So they took me to the Obatala priest, and um, he said that he knows what to do. He will appease the IA, and um, my grandma should come on a Thursday. Um, that is going to do a concoction. My, my grandma should come and um, pick the concoction. Once I eat it, my two legs will be OK, and I'll be fine. And um, so my grandma was supposed to go. Actually, great grandma. <laughs> my great grandma was supposed to go. On Thursday, uh, of Atala priest died on Wednesday. You know. <laughs> All right. Um, and then there was one that they said is very tough. He, he's in one, inside one forest around that Songo side. So they took me to him. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't know what the guy did, but um, after six months of being with him, um, life came back to the right leg. And uh, from then up to now, <laughs> the left leg is still as paralyzed as I was when I was two years old. You know, um, I was not aware of all these things. The only thing I was aware of was that as I was growing up, um, I was the privileged child. I don't do any work in the house. Ah, don't let him sweep. He doesn't have leg. Ah, don't let him carry bucket. He doesn't have leg, you know. And I was really enjoying it. I was not doing nothing in the house, uh, you know, until I was eight years old. And um, we grew up in Lagos, and um, we were from Ocean State. And we grew, go home most times once a year. And that Christmas, our father took us to the village. And um, of course, when we got to the village, we discovered that the Christmas festivity of that year coincided with the mass grave festival of the village. Um, so one of those days, um, while we were in the village, I went out. I, I was eight years old. So there was one of my uncles who was just a year older than me, son of my grandfather, fourth or fifth wife, you know. And um, like four or five of us left the family compound. I said, let's go around the town. And when we got to the market square of the village, we just had this drumming coming from nowhere. And immediately the drumming started, everybody started running the elder skelter. All the villagers started running. And we guys that came from Lagos, we were trying to ask them, why are you running? What happened? And he said, that's masquerade that you're hearing the drumming. It just came out, and it's not supposed to meet anybody on the road. You know, and immediately they said that. All the guys we left my family compound together. Of course, <laughs> everybody took to their heels. And then I was supposed to run also, you know. And I was fright in the hair. And, um, you know, this leg is the only one um, active. This one has been out of um, service <laughs> for a long while. And I was supposed to run. And um, the only way I could run was to hop on this leg. And then boom, 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 boom. So I will fall over and I will get up again. I want to run. Then, of course, I discovered that there is no way I was going to escape without this uh, masquerade catching up with me. So I started screaming and crying and just begging somebody to come and help me. And um, interestingly, nobody stopped. Nobody um, yielded to my cry. And um, you know, that day, was a turning point in my life. I was so young, but I was aware of everything happening around me. And that day, I just discovered I started making some, some very serious decisions in my heart. I just said, oh, all right, so this is the way life really is. In life, when you think you need people most, that's when they will desert you. So I told myself, I'm not going to trust people again. And then, of course, why was I crying? The disability was not going to make me move as fast enough. So I told myself, and I won't allow this leg to be an hindrance to me in life. I'm going to make it in life. People that have deserted me, I'm going to prove to them that I can make it. 
So from that point, I picked up one thing. I said, I have a point to prove in life. You know? And, um, you know, at the point, I didn't know where, what happened to the masquerade. But then my uncle ran back, and he said, Kola jumped on my back. I jumped on his back, and I discovered that I changed my, the gel of my crying. And I felt, all right, so people will only come back when it's convenient for them, not because it's okay for you. You know, he, he discovered that the masquerade had taken another route. I never knew. That was why he came back. So that day, everything changed in my life. From that day, don't tell me I can't sweep again. Don't tell me I can't fetch water. Don't tell me I can't do anything. Because I know another day will come. I will need somebody to help me fetch water. And they will all desert me. So I will follow them to the, <laughs> I'll follow them to go and fetch water. Even though by the time we get home, you know, I walk like this. I wasn't even using the walking stick then. So, you know, we bucket on your head and you are going like this. Um, a full bucket gets to like one quarter. But you know, I was always proud. I said, yes, I fetched it myself. That's beautiful. <laughs> I fetched That's it myself. That's just such a beautiful story. I think one of the things that has intrigued me by the story is, is the fact that regardless of what it is that you we had no control over that happened to you, you decided not only to not let it um, define who it is that you are, but you decided to take upon yourself to show yourself that that thing that is a disability will not be a disability. Exactly. And so I wanted to ask something. As you moved on in life and began a career, how did this decision influence working in the marketplace? How did this okay. influence <laughs> It's so interesting, you know. Uh, career started with NYC. I, I was posted to Ogu State, Abe Okuta. I served with NYC, I mean MPC, National Population Commission. Of course, they were preparing for census then, so they requested for like 10 coppers. And then suddenly out of the nine, 10 coppers, they saw one of them with disability. They were so disappointed. They felt um, what we want to do is more of field work. We need able-bodied people. Why should they give us <laughs> one that is not able-bodied, you know? So they left me in the office. Um, at least you can, you can work on files. I said, no problem. Until they had problems, um, we were given deadline to finish demarcation and we were far behind. So they had to pour every staff in the office to the field. So I had the free privilege of going to the field. And, um, you know, so I studied how they do the things on the field. And um, we were supposed to demarcate locations. And we go Mondays and come back Fridays into the into bush and forest. You know, so with time, I just, I just came up with a style of getting the job done faster. You know, normally when we come back home um, Fridays, Mondays we have progress meeting, and everybody, every group must give an account. And they say, some people say, are we able to cover five locations in the course of the week? Some will say nine, best 12. You know, with time, I just came up with a style of, how can we cover more than 40 in a week? And then, you know, <laughs> I, I was born again then, so Holy Spirit was working in me. And one day I just came back um, and we were having progress meeting. People said five, seven, ten. And I said, actually, I covered 40 locations. And they screamed. They said, ow. And then the next moment, I said, the next week, I said 50. The next one, I said 60. Yet people were still covering 10. And, you know, um, of course, census came. I was the best staff. I was the first to be promoted. Um, you know one thing that happened from that age eight? I just discovered, I just developed that can-do spirit. I just always tell myself, Kola, you can do it. You can do it. Even when my father said, Kola, you can't drive a manual car, I smiled. I said, Father, I, told, I just told him, I'm going to drive this your car. 
you know, I, I taught myself, because I had that can do spirit, how to use uh, my hand to press my leg on the clutch, you know, and then you press the clutch, and then you use this one to press the brake and the accelerator. So, I, I, you know, I just learned how to drive by myself. So anywhere I find myself, I said, I can do it, you know. So after census, I left National Population Commission, and I needed an so I applied to a particular organization. Um, they also do more field works. And um, I think like 2,000 of us um, applied then. I'm not sure how many people they needed. And so they've been inviting people to the interview room. They were spending some 20, 30, 40 minutes with them. And then it was my turn. You know, immediately I stepped in. And the panel, when they saw this guy walking with walking stick, they just looked at themselves. <laughs> and uh, one of them, in a very, 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 um, was so pitiable, he just said, it, uh, Mr. Lugodi, um, I understand you came for the interview. We are not going to waste your time. In the next five minutes, five minutes you'll be out of this place. You know? And um, of course, I understood what they meant. Um, if you are looking for animals with on, we are not looking for snail. What well, that's the meaning of it. So we are not looking for somebody like you. But I smiled because they didn't know who entered. You know, um, <laughs> you know, you know, thank you. You know what I did? Um, and since then, well, I think that was the last application I wrote before I started my own business. Um, I knew they were not going to give me any chance. So my application was a story of course, that was the CV, but my application letter was a story, was a story letter. I told them the story of my life. I told them my can do spirit. I told them what I've achieved in life. And I told them what I was going to do to change their complaint. So they, you need me more than I need you. So, you know, of course, my application letter was six page, full scap, because it was story. And you will not be tired of that story. So they have placed my application by the side. So immediately I sat down and said, so what's your name again? I said, oh, look at you. I said, where is the CV? I said, I said ah, that's the CV. So then I brought my CV. So, oh, you are the owner of this CV? I said, yes. You know, and interestingly, they were trying to discern how can someone like you say you have this type of experience? You know, and by the time they started asking me questions, for some of you that get afraid of interview, don't be afraid. Just tell them who you are. You understand, you are a professional, you are an expert. Don't go and beg them to apply. They need you, you understand. And so I sold myself to them, and um, I was the only one now noticing the time. 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, when it was going beyond one hour, they spoke to themselves and said, somebody else will join us. And then the CEO of the company joined them. Wow. And you know, when you are doing interview and CEO comes in, it's like, um, sir, if we tell you, you won't believe. Come and see by yourself. You know, of course, um, they said there was going to be another interview. But the next letter I got was that I should come start working, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was going to, not to, not to cut you short, but then there's something that was going through my mind, and I don't want you to, to pass this before okay. hitting on it. You said you, you knew what it is that they meant when they said, we will only give you, we won't take too much of your time. And from all the things that you have said, I can hear that you were very discerning that people were, of, were looking at your disability and reading and placing labels on you and all of that. And so I'm asking myself, how is it that you, in those few seconds before you are given the opportunity to speak, talk to yourself out of what it is that people were already reading about you? No, it didn't happen for the first time that day. I've yeah. always had it. Mm. You understand? Anywhere I go, nobody gives me the chance. So I'm the one that I've told myself that, Kola, you have a point to prove. You understand? So when they say, oh, no, like my father said, you can't drive. 
I got that when I was just leaving secondary school. So I'm always getting, no, you can't. No, we don't need you. So I'm the one that needs to prove. And you know, um, I talk to people living with disability so much. They come with that sense of entitlement. You know, I was in a place one day and said, eh, we also went to university and they, they, they are not giving us job. They, there should be a quota for people living with disability. That when they want to do employment, they should always give, I said, I beg your pardon. There was, was there any quota for you when you were in the university? When I was in the university, it's better these days you have Okada. There was no Okada. Sister Jumi knows. I will have a lecture in um, human resources. And the next lecture is in BOC. I'm talking about almost uh, my own speed, uh, almost 45 minutes. You understand? And the lecturer is not going to wait for me. And there was no sense of entitlement. Uh, they are not pitying me. They don't even know that I have one bad leg. It's what you call yourself that people will call you. You understand? Uh -huh. And you know from age eight, I've told myself, you leg, you're not an hindrance, you're a plus. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? So I have trained myself to always get to the point where people will feel, oh, all right, it is you. And I need to prove beyond that point that even <laughs> choosing a wife, you understand? Who is going to marry somebody with one leg? You can be fine, though. You understand? Even brilliant. But then, it's not the person that wants to say yes to you that matters. But then, there are other people that need to be involved. The parents, the friends. I, I, I faced it, you know. Uh, my wife, I pursued her for four years. <laughs> and she was saying, no, 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 no. You know, and I told myself, I deserve the best. I'm going to get the best mm. wife. You like, you're not going to hinder me. If anybody say no, it's because they are not my best. When you say yes, you are going to be my best. I, you know, you need, to, you need to know how to bring yourself up. And if you are a child of God, in fact, that changes the whole thing. Mm. I'm much more than conqueror through Christ that strengthens me. Those are the things that have helped me to always, anywhere I get to, I don't feel intimidated. I don't have any low self-esteem. <laughs> My self-esteem is so high, you understand. Most times, it's people looking at me that pity me and say, hey, yeah, and then me, I smile and say, if you know who I am, you won't be saying, hey, yeah, to me. You know, so I think that's, that's what has helped me so much. Yes. You um, know. Yes. Interestingly, I have about two more questions before okay. we wrap up. Um, the first for me, which is um, something that I really want to know, is you speak about disability that is physical, right? Okay. That is very obvious. And I know that so many people out there are, have some form of, you know, disability and as a result, they, they, are, they keep wanting to act entitled, keep wanting to place some form of pressure, obligation on other people to do things for them. And when that doesn't happen, they now have an excuse. And most of the times, those excuses seem like they are valid, right? I just want you to sort of speak to that, to say, if you have a disability in whatever form, right? I want you to just stress the importance of not acting entitled and the fact that you need, it, you need to owe it to yourself to be the best that you can be regardless of what it is. I just want you to stress that out so that people do not think that it is just strictly about physical disabilities, yes. that there are a range of things. It, it's not even disability alone. I know some, some of us, it's always like our background. Um, the way you were giving back to maybe daddy and mommy were not there, you were maltreated, you were abused, something that eroded your self-esteem. You know, something just tells you, I am not like them. I can never be like them. Everyone is better than me. You understand, when you have something like that, number one is your self-esteem. And sincerely speaking, you're a child of the living God. God can help you. I, I, I learned how to work on myself even before I became a Christian. 
So becoming a Christian was, it just, I mean, exploded everything the more. No matter what your background is like, no matter what you have been through in life, no matter the type of disability or whether there is no disability, sincerely speaking, you have your life to live. Are you listening to me? And sincerely speaking, let me tell you, from the day I was given battle, when the IAs were doing their things, and up till now, life has never been fair. And never, life will never be fair. You understand? But I don't care what life is saying. I only care what I want out of life. And I go for what I want. Are you listening to me? I was young and I told my mother, I still remember very, maybe I was 11, 10 or 11, I can't remember the age. I remember we were in our sitting room and I told my mother, I said, you know I'm going to be great in life. Do you know I'm going to be commanding businesses? I'm going to be doing businesses across the nation. I'm going to, you know, and you know, I was saying it. I was smiling and my mother could actually, she was saying, Amilo Rukajisu, Amilo Rukajisu. I was saying it, I was smiling, but I mean what I was saying. So, as I was going on in life, I knew where I was going. It's not when I got there that I said, oh, okay, ah, I can go somewhere. I had known where I'm going, disability or no disability, long time ago. I knew I was going to be great. I knew I'm going to start something great in Nigeria. Becoming a Christian made a difference. You understand? So, um, to answer your question directly, Please, nobody owes you anything in life. Are you listening to me? Even that job that I said, uh, they said five minutes, they gave me the job, I turned it down because I was much, much more they wanted to pay. Mm. I knew my worth. They were not doing me a favor. You understand? Maybe they felt, all right, let's give him that amount. After all, will he get job any other place? I wasn't looking for a job. I was going to start my home. You understand? So, nobody owes you nothing. Nobody. And I keep, I tell people with disability, I wanted to employ one of them in my office. He had everything going for him. Number one, he had first class. Number two, he went to OAU, IFE. Number three, he finished from my faculty. Number four, he had disability. And he made first class. In Ife, for that matter. I just told the HR department, I said, um, so that I won't look like the CEO just brought the guy in. I said, go and chat with him. And then let's know when he can start working. And you know, they went and they, come, they came back to me and they said, um, they call me Oak. Um, Olubo the Alexander. They say, Oak, this guy knows nothing. Mm. I, I said, what do you mean? I, of course, I felt they were, they were saying that because of his disability. Meanwhile, I knew what I wanted him to do. Why, why, you know? I said, what do you mean that he knows nothing? I said, sir, this guy knows nothing. And they sensed that sense of entitlement. So I had to sit down with him and I discovered that this guy was fighting. Fighting that, all right, so nobody will do something for me. That's why I got first class, so that somebody can do something for me. I said, Mr. Man, you have first class. You know, I wasn't going to interview you at first. I wanted you to start working. But you have one serious sense of entitlement smelling all over you. You're not going to get a job here. And if you don't change, you won't get a job any other place. Mm. Your first class, notwithstanding. Mm. I don't know whether I'm making any sense to anyone. Please, Bible says, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Walk out even your own life mm. with fear and trembling. Add value to your life. Make yourself somebody they can't just push over. 
Nobody can push me over anywhere. Not because of anything. It's because I know who I am. That's why I love that song. I know who was that song. I'm not a good singer. I walk in power. I walk in a miracle. I live a life of favor. I know who I am. Do you know who you are? Look at me. I may wonder. Abby? This uh -huh. is glory. I know who I am. Maybe you should help me sing it. Then I will drop it in my cabin. <laughs> All right. Help, us, help me sing that song for yourself, not for me. Do you know who you are? Okay. When he says I am, I know who I am. I know who he says I am. What he says I am. Yeah, he says I am. I know who I am. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in victory. Okay, so I took the mic because there was somebody by my side who wanted to talk. And you know we take uh, contributions from the crowd. So Ambassador Amy was telling me something about her father. Quickly tell me about your father. Yes. Uh, praise God. Hallelujah. My dad um, is physically handicapped. He okay. got polio at the age of, I think, five. Okay. He went to school. He gave his life to Jesus later and then went to school at age 21 to class one. And started school... You know, the, he was the age mate of the teachers, you know, who were pinching him and all that. And he, he scored A all through. He finished his primary. He went to high school. Nobody to pay for his school fees, nothing. He lived by faith. But because of the will that you said, I can, you decide to live and you live regardless of what is surrounding you, regardless of the reality that you see. When you have the will, you can go very far. So he, he finished school. He cleared high school with very good grades. He's on wheelchair himself. He can't walk with any of the legs. He's on wheelchair and brought us up. I'm his second born daughter and uh, four children, all educated. And we never, personally, I never knew that my dad was handicapped because he never gave us that that sense that is disabled. So we grew like normal children. I even thought that other children, their parents had a problem because my dad was different. So he cleared school, he cleared high school, he went to the college, he went to the university, mm -hmm. he has been a bishop, he has been secretary general, he has been working with the government, he just retired. He went to school that he missed for 21 years. He has done his master's. He's now in school doing his doctorate, so it is possible. I just had to, because I've seen a photo that Ambassador Amy um, posted, and when I say ambassador, she's a real ambassador plenipotentiary for Kenya. She's a national treasure in Kenya. You know, Nigerians, we don't know what's going on. So when people approach us in Kenya, I'm thought, oh, um, hello, I'm about to talk to them. I realize they're not even talking to me. She's the one they're talking to. It's so strange. I was in San Francisco once with a Kenyan, right? And I, I thought I'd pass where they put me. It was something to do with Cartier. You know, I thought I shouldn't be here. So, forgive me, these people are not my mates. And then there was this Kenyan lady. And then I go, oh, you're from Kenya? She goes, yes. I said, oh, so is my daughter, Ambassador Amy. She goes, you know Amy? I'm like, oh, yeah, I do know Amy. She travels with me to Ghana. We go to Israel together. I can't believe you know Amy. I'm like, I do know her. And see me proving that I know Amy. I thought this is not going well. So I dialed Amy. I was on the bus that day. I was like, hey, please, oh, when we go to Ghana, the first lady is with us. I don't quite get it. Because I miss Kenyans. I love you, Kenyans. Watch it. I say they're so laid back. They're horizontal. So I was like, I don't quite get it. So I gave the phone to the lady. And then Amy speaks. I said, Amy, speak to her. I can't believe I'm speaking to you. Amy. And then she looks at me and I said, I'm out of here. 
True, true. That's how I left the place. But I'm letting you know, somebody who was supposed to not have even ever go to primary school ended up bringing up just one of the four children is a national treasure. What if he didn't? You know, so picking yourself up and making a difference in your life is not personal. It's private to you, but it's generational. Now she's a, going to be a blessing. To, she's a blessing to us in Nigeria. She's a blessing all over the world because one man decided that he was not going to live with the hand that life dealt him. He decided it was more than that. You see, uh, you notice nobody clapped when he said, life owes you nothing. Does life owe you anything? Emmanuel Eliki just joined us. So does life owe you anything? No. Why, why are you saying that? You're supposed to be a celebrity. You know, should celebrities not help people? Uh, you, you work for yourself. Work for yourself. You rich people are wicked. No, no, they are. We look at rich people. Pastor Femi. I don't mind to say you got a third class in Futa. How come you went, not, not in Ifeo, but we will forgive him in Futa. How come you continued moving on? Does life owe you anything? Or how did you push on in life? Why didn't you just get the third class, finish it there? Look, this is a third class. Obviously, they're telling me I don't know what I'm doing. How come you just flew in from London? When we're in London, you flew into London. You are flowing, flying into Nigeria. With this, I don't understand how you are doing it. Can you enlighten us? Cut soap for us, please. Amen. It is school that say I'm a third class older. Life never said that. I'm not encouraging you to have a third class. Uh, but everything pushed me towards third class. But I got the certificate and I said, this is not me. Hear me? That was my physics ability, not my destiny ability. Did you get that? That was what physics. That was what physics said you can bring out. But I checked myself. I am more than physics. There is something in me more than physics. So while I was in school, I was already stepping one leg outside. From 300 level, no, 100 level self. I knew that this thing might not work. You know why? Because for four hours practical, Futurians, are you here? Thank you. For four, yeah, thank you. My guys are there from Akure. <laughs> so for four hours practical, there was no light for three and a half hours. So who is to blame? Me or the school system? But the school system is like that. On your day of graduation, you can't blame your VC. The laboratory did not work. That your teachers are using old, your teachers are using old notes. You can't blame them. So early enough, I, I took my life in my hands and said, God, beyond school, what do you have for me? Beyond certificate, where, hear this one, oh, beyond certificate, where is my satisfaction? And God showed me early that Femi Post, 2014, June 23, June 23, 2012, 3.30 a.m. Wake up, I woke up. He said, start transforming the face of agriculture. Go on YouTube and check it. Start transforming the face of agriculture. When your lecturer has finished schooling you, let the Holy Ghost school you. Let the Holy Ghost give you certificates. Even no one does that. He had a first class, but he couldn't get it. But I was speaking in Rwanda. Um, what's his name? This richest man from Zimbabwe was seated there. Uh, Stripe Masiwa. And when I spoke for two minutes, he said, I want to beat that guy. Plus third class. Go on YouTube. I spoke with good Lord Jonathan for 44 seconds. You're going to turn Akiumi Adeshino. Hear that guy. Ah, somebody who's amen will turn that. Yeah. That guy is so. Someone's going to say, hello, Baba Lalao, and I caught him there. So you're going to round up. Yeah. Now, thank you. All right. Um, just as we're rounding up, um, I don't think we can take any questions from the, from the crowd. But I want you to just say something. I also want you to give a word of advice um, to the people out there. And then I will call up um, Mrs. A to cut the cake and a number of people for the cutting of the cake. But I just want you to say a couple of words um, to everyone, every young person out there. Something that you know that they need to hear. That one, about their journey with God, but then also about their journey in life. All right. Um, 
your journey in life all depends on your journey in God. You understand? The things that changed my life completely was my accepting the Lord Jesus. And you see, accepting the Lord Jesus is not about, it's not religion. You understand? It's you entering into a very cordial relationship with your creator. You understand? One of the things that changed my life to this point is that my relationship with him, the ability to speak to your master and he's able to talk back to you. You know, I made a big mistake in life. I thought I'm supposed to run my life the way I want it. You know, so when I left, of course, that place, I moved to a bank. When I left the bank, I just said, yeah, let me go into business. And I'll say, okay, what is the next business moving here? And I saw the business, I jumped into it. It seemed to be working. And then at a point, it just rubbished me. And I kept on struggling to do one thing after the other. And I kept on going down and down and down for almost like seven years. Then 2001, January, when everybody was crying, Happy New Year, I told myself nothing will be happy about this year except the Lord help me. You know? And that January, I said, God, I want to hear you. I've tried by myself enough. Show me the way. And I was just praying. And it, it, just, it just led me to Isaiah chapter 41 from verse 10. Fear not, I will help you. Don't be dismayed, I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. All those that are incensed against you, they will be as nothing. You will look for them, you won't find them. Then we got to verse 15. God said, I will make you into a new sharp pressing instrument, having teeth. You will stretch the mountains, you will beat them small. You will make the eels as chaff. You know, when we got to verse 15, I said, okay, sir, okay, sir. Um, what are you saying, sir? And God said, Kola, I'm going to start something entirely new through you in Nigeria. Nobody is doing it yet. You know, and the question was, so God, what is new? What is new? What is new? Of course, at the point God said, going to human resources. And then, of course, because that failed, I started human resources. I was giving out support staff, drivers, messengers, and everything. And then, you know, most times when I give out staff, I get afraid. And then the people I saw that source from me say, Oh, Mr. Lubudi, can you vouch for them? I say, Yes, I can vouch for them. But then I was always afraid. I felt there was something else missing that I ought to be doing, that I ought not to be doing. I mean, that I should be doing that I'm not doing. And then suddenly it just occurred to me. Why not begin to verify some of their claims? The places where they claim to have worked in the past, check it out. Um, do they have criminal records? Their educational certificate, is it genuine? You know? And suddenly, that was how the idea came. And before I knew it, the background industry was giving back to, you, you know? So, I can tell you by his grace, I am who I am. I started the business not having a cobble. But to his glory, we have like 100 staff now. We are moving across Africa. You know? And then, you know, in rounding off, you don't know where God will yet take you if you will put your trust in him. You know, it was at a point when in US they had that a Nigerian was doing background check. And then they had to send for me. They said, we found out you do background check in Africa. Nigeria is Africa to them. Ghana is Africa. Everywhere is Africa. So they say you do background check in Africa. Can you come over to the U.S. and show us how you do it? You know, I, I, of course, I was invited to the U.S. I went to the embassy and um, I was interviewed. The guy that was interviewing was first joking. I said, I, I'm, I'm invited as a speaker. Um, to come talk on background check in U.S. The guy said, is there any background check company in Nigeria? Are you sure there's anything? And of course, I discovered that at a point, he was no more asking me 
visa question. I discovered I was curious to know more about background check and sincerely I just changed it to marketing and I started marketing background check to him and the guy said, you know what, we need your service in-house. So I got my two-year visa, I got a job in the U.S. consulate, you know, I thought it was going to end there. The guy said, the day you walked up to me, I knew there was something different in you. I've interviewed not less than 6,000 6, Nigerians. But when you walked up, you were different. He said, after, that was after I'd come back from US and I'd, you know, I was already working for them with the consulate. And then he just said, you know what? You're going to get a call from you, Washington. Uh, US government will call you. And um, one day I got the call and um, your eyes have not yet seen. Your ears have not heard. I don't care what your background is like. I don't care whether you are an orphan. I don't care what has happened in your life up to today. Pick up your life from now and say this life is going to make a meaning. You understand? People always want to pray for my leg. I says, leave that leg go. It's opening doors. Uh -huh. So I'm healed. I'm so healed. If you know how much I prayed on this leg to be healed, I never knew God was going to heal it another way. Thank you so much, Sir Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's time to cut the cake. Tomorrow is Valentine's, yes? And even as we've heard about the relationship that everybody should have with the greatest love, yeah. today as we cut the cake, um, I want this to just be the beginning of great things for everybody here today. All right, put your hands together for yourself as well. I remember Brother Kola from Drama Department in Ife. Nothing stopped him. Whatever role you gave him, he played. So I still remember that resilience. So he wanted me to come and speak on through it all. I said, you first, then me after. Okay. Let the young person hold the cake. The meeting is for you. Okay. okay. All right. We're going to spell Jesus together. And at the end of Jesus, we'll cut the cake. All right. Everybody, can we go J? E? E? S, S U, U S, S Jesus Now, let me talk about Do you have gifts for us? You've given them out So how many ladies got a rose? We can go to our seats How many ladies got a rose? Wave your roses Oh That's just so you know we love you How many guys got a gift, Shai? <laughs> You did. You got a gift too. Uh, as we are ending, I'm going to have books here. I want to give out books, different kinds of books. Some are on business, some are Christian books. We'll just put them here at the end. Can that be arranged? Okay. So at the very end of the program, we'll have books here. So you can pick yourself a Valentine gift that will change your life. You understand? Because you will read something that will reset you. Music